welcome back to another episode of Reinforce the Horse. Today we are here with Mona Illerbrunn. Mona, thank you so much for joining us today. Horses are a vital part of Mona's life. Mona's relationship with horses began the moment she was able to walk. From then on, every free moment was spent with horses. Mona is most at home when she is when she is with horses, whether that be cleaning the stalls, riding bareback out on the trails, or in remote country. Riding bareback has taught Mona the importance of balance with a light hand in creating free movement, balance, congruency, and willingness in her horse. Mona's health journey has given her a unique perspective and a strong understanding of the importance of being present, free of judgment, patient, and how the human is the key when connection is to be realized. From a young age, she found her empathetic nature always trying to make things better for horses, and this led her to the realization that she, as the human, was the key. Using her energy, curiosity, vital acuity, and awareness, she learned to decipher what horses were saying. Feeling seen, felt, heard, and understood are integral to worth for both horses and human. Very cool. Welcome. Thank you ever so much, Alyssa and Jason, for having me. Um, I guess I would like to start off by kind of talking a little bit about when I was little. My parents weren't horse people. And so how I popped out <laughs> to have this affinity for horses, I have no idea how that happened. But the affinity was so strong when I was little that as soon as I was on two legs and mobile, every time my mom turned her back, I disappeared. And then they would spend hours looking for me, and then they'd find me wherever the closest horse would be. Now, I somehow was drawn to where they were, because it's not like as a toddler I knew where they were, but I would just find myself pulled for my entire life. I have felt like I am at home home when I'm around horses. That wasn't something that I got later on. It was born into me somehow. As human beings, we all want to always have answers for everything. We want to be able to figure everything out. And uh, my life journey has kind of taught me that, you know, that, that's not how things work and that's not how they're meant to be experience that's one of the things about being human is so much of the time we're trapped in our heads instead of living in our bodies and in the moment and as that young person being attracted to the horses now you know I can recognize that part of that was because of the congruency so they exist solely in the moment and when you're really little so do you and so that was, you know, probably some of the biggest draw for me back then. And then when you love something so much like that, then you want to try to figure out everything you can about it. I'm pretty curious. <laughs> so, so then I would be like, oh, well, why do they do this? Oh, why do they do that? And then I would watch and I would see something and then I'd think, well, I don't know if that's valid. I better make sure I can replicate this same thing a few times before I can make sure that what I'm seeing and is really what it is. And everything started with me when I was really, really, really young, super, super curious. And um, yeah, so that's how I got started. And then life had other ideas <laughs> for me. And I, uh, a lot of what I had, I lost when I had a moderate traumatic brain injury. So life as I knew it was gone in the blink of an eye. Yeah, that was a pretty big thing. My eyes even changed colors. So I had green eyes, and then after the accident, they were blue. So even looking in the mirror, I, it was hard for me to know me because I didn't look the same. And then, of course, I wasn't the same. And so I had this big journey trying to figure out who I was. 
because I could remember who I was, but I didn't know who this new person was. And so you make a lot of mistakes and because you're making decisions based on somebody that you knew, but you can't make them for this person now because you don't really know her. You haven't spent enough time to know her. But yet, because you're still standing upright and breathing, everybody thinks that you should be able to make all these choices and decisions. Well, it just kind of doesn't work that way, or at least it didn't for me. And um, so then fast forwarding along, I uh, recover enough that I become more aware of my deficits and more aware of what I lost. And so then I wanted it back because connectiveness with the universe or connectedness with energy or horses, whatever kind of word you want to use, like that energetic reprosity, I can't even say the word now, reprosity, hamburgering the word, but nonetheless, that's me. So, and because I knew what it felt like, that's kind of what helped me in that journey because I kept trying different things till I could get that feeling back. Eventually, I I got there. But when, what I learned on that, that journey was really like a Lego building block exercise. So I learned what you need first in order to build on top of that, to build on top of that. So in essence, you know, maybe the, the whole brain injury thing was the universe's had in mind that I would be curious enough to sort this out, curious enough to figure something out, and then be able to teach others because I've spent my whole life teaching and I get a lot of joy out of being able to help others. And that's kind of how my Partner Up program got started because as I recovered more and more and more, well, and I, I guess I'm going to change that because recovery is the wrong word. Do you think uh, it was a, a function of, of perhaps letting go? That's what, where I was going to go. I was going to uh, go with acceptance and figuring out how to work with what you have here and now without any judgment about what you should have, could have, would have, and just accept and move and work from there. Now, I've always given horses that grace. So I had to learn how to give it to myself. That wasn't very that, easy, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear that. That's so profound. Uh, so just recently, this past week, Alyssa and I were filmed for a new documentary that's coming out. It's called Rescued Hearts. And they are producing this film about how Horses have a healing power in the horse-human connection. They just released a film this past year called Love Heals, pretty much about how love heals and how you have to have like an inner love for yourself before you can uh, begin on that healing journey. And in there, uh, there's a quote that comes up and it's really right along the lines with what you just said is that healing is a journey of acceptance. It sounds like you had that come into your life front and center. I've come across a number of different stories and various podcasts and books and such about those types of things, be it near-death experiences or some sort of traumatic event. Yeah, I I love that idea of of acceptance. Yeah. 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 It's a pretty big ticket item. I was always the if there's a will, there's a way, girl. And um, so no shortage of coming up with mythologies or ways. And none of them were along the acceptance line because it's all about doing. And it's all about being. And it's all about judging your progress. Yeah, so over the years, I had to eat a lot of crow because everything that I kind of believed in that I thought was just right off there, front line and center, kind of like 
kept kicking me in the face till I got it. Yeah. And, and it's all part of what I teach because we're all human and, you know, we grow up in an environment that kind of bends and shapes us, whether we realize it or not. And it impacts the quality of our life, whether we realize it or not. And um, now that I'm kind of like on the other side, you look back through that tunnel, I realize that if I hadn't been shaped to uh, value what I could produce and value uh, how much I could produce, some of my journey would not have been so difficult. But when I look around, I'm not alone in that shaping. And I see that it affects almost everybody I meet because we're constantly judged. We're constantly evaluated. We are like it's never ending. So you wear the wrong T-shirt and you hear about it for the rest of your life. And, and then it's more complex all along the way. And then people pack that along with them because they remember those remarks. They remember the times when it was uncomfortable because it didn't quite fit in. Or they remember the words somebody said to them. And it really becomes a defining part of how they function. So yeah, so part of what I'm teaching is on a mission to try to undo all of that and to try to get people to see that once you get it, the only thoughts you have in your mind is like, whoa, what took me so long to get here? Like, hold it here. Oh, what have I been doing my whole life? And so there's a huge part of that because I think that life is meant to be joyful. And I think life is meant to be whole. And I think we are meant to be perfect Everything about us is perfect because we're unique and we're all part of the universe. And when we are able to let ourselves be in that reality, what happens inside our bodies is beautiful instead of stressful. And it's really easy not to take things personally. And it's really easy to ask more questions, to get more information because you're not in a place where you're feeling judged. So you don't feel the need to validate. You don't feel the need to prove yourself. You can just be and know that that's enough and know that there's worth there. Yeah, I, I don't think life is meant to be as hard as what we make it on ourselves. And I totally I agree. And it, it seems the more I dive into the inner self, the more the outer becomes this sort of free-flowing way. It begs a question in my mind, though. It, it sounds like you've alluded kind of to not necessarily buying into or believing that prior to your brain injury. Uh, is that is that true? Or was it just more that the brain injury sort of was a catalyst to have you jump in head first into that way of being? Well, I think the universe was sending me messages. <laughs> I think I was ignoring them because back then I was very good at that. And I was very, very, very busy, very high functioning. I think I was meant to go on a different journey. May have listened. That journey may have taken a different form, but I didn't. And that's not surprising to me at all because <laughs> that was so me back then. No, 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 I don't have time for this. I got a job to do. <laughs> so tell us this. more about that. What were you what were you doing uh, prior to your injury? I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you bits and pieces. So when I look at my day planner now, I think, oh my God, that's like ten people. Oh, I was doing all, all of that. Like holy so I was teaching 0.7 time at an elementary school, grade five, six split. And um, then I was also 
teaching and designing course modules for BCIT, which is a uh, technological university. And I was also designing course modules and teaching for Malaspina University. And on top of all of that, I had 16 campsites that I was providing maintenance and security for. And I had a staff. And then I was teaching for the IWA. <laughs> like, I mean, it is pretty... I look at what I have in my day planner and I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> I was doing all that, holy smokes, wow. And um, the year of my accident, I won Entrepreneur of the Year Award. And so, yeah, um, and so parts of like the campsite and maintenance and stuff, I was excelling because I had total freedom. I was self-employed and and so they'd say to me, oh, well, this can't be fixed. Well, that would be like telling me something can't be done. And so then that whole other side of me would get totally uh, drawn in and be like, no, I can solve this. I can fix this. And that creative part totally fueled my drive with what I was doing. And parts of what I designed got used in the conservation program because it was really helpful in dealing with difficult people. I did liaison work with the RCMP because I could go down into groups of two and 300 and dissip dissipate them or um, bring them back under control when they're out of control. And yeah, so I, I was doing a lot of stuff. And back then, I wouldn't have been able to tell you why I was so good at what I was I can tell you now because now I've thought about it but back then I was just too busy doing it so I've always been really intuitive and because I grew up probably not the best environment you really hone skills in how to read your environment and know how to operate in that environment in order to stay safe and so it was really easy for me to go down into a group of three or 400 because I, I would know instantly <laughs> who was going to say what and what I needed to say to de-escalate and, and bring stuff down. So I was using what I was born with that I had totally honed. And then I was using it when I was teaching too because as soon as I would touch somebody, it was like I would plug in and I could walk around in their brain and then I'd know exactly where they are stuck. So then I'd know what to say to get them unstuck so that they could move forward. And like at the time, a lot of the students, whether they were older students or the younger students, they used to always tease me and say I was the Pied Piper. And I never really understood it because I had never, ever really given any thought to what kind of space or environment I was creating to them. I was just busy doing, doing what needed to be done so that they're successful. Because if they're successful, then I'm successful. And, and so this whole journey and trying to get back what I lost really made me dig deep and look at everything differently, I guess, so now I understand why they called me the Pied Piper. And they used to tease me, oh, Miss I, you have this big golden glow all around you. And as long as we're in that golden glow, we'll go anywhere with you. <laughs> and I never got it. But now, you know, I see the same thing happening with my horses. I see the same thing when I'm around other people, especially when somebody's having trouble or, or there's stuff that's really inside that's bothering them. Because now that I've managed to get some of this stuff back for myself, I know exactly what to say so they feel better. And then when they it's feel better, definitely like an, I feel better. Empathic feel, yeah. Yeah. When I make other people feel better, I feel better because I feel what they're feeling. So, so if I can make them feel better, then my body feels better. And so it's it's kind of win win, right? I hear that. Is there a, a any particular one or multiple horses that have helped you along this journey? All of my horses have given me gifts. You know, prior to my brain injury, like I said, I was a slow learner. 
I didn't listen very good. So, well, I'll start off with Rosebud. So Rosebud came into my life when I was a young teenager. I slept in the barn with her. If I went camping, she came with me. I didn't need to tie her up. Like wherever I was, she was. So I had that kind of a relationship with her. And if I slept too long in the tent, she'd open the tent and drag me out by the sleeping bag and shake it up and down and like, get up, we're going to go do stuff. So I thought at that time that that's what relationships were like with horses. I had no idea that this was something that most people never get to experience. I, I didn't know that. That's what I had and that's what it was like. And then I got... Kohiti. And so huh, she was nothing like Rosebud. <laughs> so she didn't like me and she didn't like people. And, you know, if I could stay on long enough, then we had a good ride. But staying on <laughs> without getting bucked off was quite the performance in the early stages. But she taught me how to ride. Like without her, I, I wouldn't be the rider that I was because. I had to learn how to use my my body in total conjunction with her body because I rode bareback. And if you fall off, well, she's going to try to stomp and kill you. So falling off kind of you didn't want to do very often. And so I really learned how to read everything that their body was saying and to know exactly what muscles inside my body needed to react or engage because hanging on with your legs was not an option because that just made everything worse. So from my, you know, four inches above my knee down could never touch her sides. So, I, I mean, it was tough learning, no doubt, but she made me the rider that I am. And then um, moving on from her, I, I got Lady. Lady, same thing. She bucked pretty good. But eventually we got that figured out. I had her for 28 years. And so we had a really good bond. And she constantly poked holes in me. So the minute I would relax and be looking around and not paying attention to her, she'd buck me off. The minute I would do something she didn't like, she'd just look me in the face and then stretch her foot right out and plant it on my foot and twist it and grind it. She used to do all sorts of things that kind of like made me sit up and pay attention and go, oh, okay. And she taught me never to show off. Because like any person, when you have a horse that comes and you whistle and We'll get down on two knees or anything so you can get on. Well, when people come, you want to show them, yay, look at what my horse does. Well, none of those things ever came to fruition. <laughs> I was busy trying to show somebody what my me and my horse could do. And she made sure of it. In fact, most times she made me land on the ground and look like a complete idiot. Then when it was her time to go, then I had Gemini. Gemini came when I was four or five years into my recovery from the brain injury. Came as a two-year-old. He's just been gelded. And uh, <laughs> he has really high self-preservation issues. So me with disconnect issues that I had because of the brain injury, he had zero value to me because I certainly wasn't going to be able to keep him safe. So he spent a lot of time like turfing me in the ground and headbutting me and <laughs> doing all sorts of things because he didn't want this hunk of shit anywhere near him. I thought at first I could just let him be a yard ornament. But then I looked and he is too big and too beautiful. And I thought, no, I can't do that to him. So then I had to muster up and kind of like soldier on in my recovery and find out how I'm going to navigate this so that I can give him the best life possible. So in many ways, my desire to do right for him forced me across some territory that I might not have ventured on my own. What, what yeah. sort of territory exactly? <laughs> things are, things are really difficult to do. So as an example, I can't, I still can't, I can't think and do. I, 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 if I'm thinking I'm standing still, if I'm doing, I'm not thinking. I, 
I don't have uh, the ability to do two things. So if I'm doing dishes and somebody talks to me, I'm not doing dishes. And so with horses, that creates disconnects. And so then that means it also creates boundary issues. It creates a whole whack of things because you're present and then you're not present. Horses really don't like that. They actually find it rather disgusting. At least all of mine do. So it meant I had to try to figure out how to get back some of my intuitiveness so stuff could happen automatically without me having to think about it. And at the stage where I was at, that appeared to be impossible. (laughs) And I didn't know where to start. And of course, there's nowhere to go to get help with these kinds of things. At least I certainly couldn't find the people. You feel really, really alone. And you feel really, really isolated. You feel really, really hopeless. And then I felt like I had not been what I needed to be for my horse. And that was probably about the worst thing I could have felt. Some of those days were kind of dark, and um, but I kept trying. And when you have to try and it doesn't work, and you try something else and it doesn't work, and you try something else and it doesn't work, pretty soon, even me, who is pretty optimistic and whatever it gets pretty hard to want to go on and you just you know you start thinking about well maybe it doesn't need to be this hard (laughs) maybe I can just end it maybe this is how this all go down because I'll, I'll I'll put my horses down and I'm done because this is too hard of a journey I I don't have the grit I'm running out And every now and then you get a glimmer of hope. (laughs) And so I just kept trying and I kept doing what I was really good at before the brain injury. And, 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 you know, that's kind of like taking everything apart into little tiny bits and seeing how many different ways the bits can go together and it, it can still work. So I kept doing that with myself. And then I eventually figured out. So I... I still have the same deficits that those haven't left. How I interact with those deficits and how I manage my life is a thousand percent different. And is that based on on your own willingness to make choices and and be knowledgeable and understanding that? you have a choice to make or is it more about something else other than that? It is about my life, my choice. And somewhere along in that journey, there was the realization that I'm feeling beaten up because I'm beating myself up. And so I'm feeling defeated because I'm choosing to see it as defeat. Big one on perspective because if you change your perspective, everything else changes. And the same thing. So I grew up where all my value is placed on what I could produce. So suddenly now with the brain injury, I'm useless. And, and in many ways in society, I still am. Because as soon as somebody finds out I have a brain injury, they don't want to know anymore. They're just on their merry little way because they automatically have the perspective that I'm of no value to them. Perspective is a big thing. So then getting over my what I was raised to do and learning how to nurture myself was a big thing. And on the whole off side of all of that, I can honestly say I probably wouldn't have believed this. Had somebody told me this when I was in my thirties, but I can honestly say now that if you nurture yourself and you do something fun for yourself, something that makes you feel just so good and like a million bucks every single day before you do anything else, you actually accomplish more in your day than when you get up with the intent of all these things you're going to accomplish and then think you're going to have time or energy to nurture yourself. It so, sounds very familiar. We've, we've talked about that yeah. a decent amount, right? That's yeah. one of, that's been, I think, one of my struggles. Yeah. 
Likewise. Yes, yes, because it's all about judging what you did yesterday versus what you did today, judging where you think you should be versus where you are, judging, uh, you know, what someone else says about your recovery versus uh, how you actually feel about your recovery. But for a lot, a huge part of your recovery, you're hooked into what all the professionals are busy telling you. Mm -hmm. And so in most of the cases, you might as well just zip the bag shut. I can empathize with that a lot. In 2017, I was diagnosed with leukemia. At the time, that was uh, like a freight train hitting me. You know, I was, what, 37? Somewhere around there. The median age for the particular leukemia is about 68, I think. I didn't realize at the time that I kind of just really threw in the towel at that moment. Going back to that quote in, in the Love Heals film, about healing is a journey of acceptance. And so I've always, and I still believe that healing, even from cancer and other types of injuries and illnesses is possible, but healing isn't necessarily getting a report that says, or a a blessing from a medical professional saying, hey, you're now healed, or you now don't have this. It's, and I think this is what you're alluding to that. Yes healing is that journey of acceptance of like what is right now is is what it is and that's all that can be and accepting that and living in that moment and now you're alive and full of life and energy and then at least from my perspective the cancer in my life dissipated and it it's not necessarily that it doesn't exist in my blood like right now I don't know I would have to go get blood and like check it out but it, it doesn't matter, at least to that extent. Yes, yes, so that's exactly that's- what I'm, I'm saying. So you le- if you forget about getting rid of the cancer out of your body and you focus on living your beautiful life with cancer, then it totally changes everything. And so I can re- relate into the brain injury part so a lot of the obstacles that I couldn't overcome, they disappeared once I got to a place where I quit trying to get better. I just focused on where I was today and accepted that as a beautiful, awesome day and quit comparing, quit having ideas about, well, I did this yesterday, I should be able to do it today. And just accepting me. And in that process, I realized, you know, I've done that for other people my entire life. I've done it for horses my entire life. And I'm thinking, and it took me 40 years of my life to kind of figure that out. (laughs) Yeah. But And isn't it amazing how the horses help us to move into that space if we're open and willing? They're such a catalyst to like healing and they're they're just like such healing beings and even i mean we have two previously wild mustangs from the same hma and they it's evident and obvious that they've suffered a great amount of trauma we also have a rescue bashkir curly who prior to his previous owner was on his deathbed uh and So all three of our horses have suffered trauma to a large extent. And they, I mean, dad and I have both gone through a fair amount of trauma in our lives and they have helped us heal and we have helped them heal just by being open and honest and real with them and dropping our expectations for them. Like they have become our friends and our family and not just a horse. Absolutely. And and I think that um, because their energy field is so strong and the fact that they have four feet on the ground, so they're extremely well grounded. That means that whenever we're within, you know, 30 feet of them, our energetic um, field is getting increased. So our frequency is increasing 
And when our frequency increases, we feel better. They do that just because they're alive. They, they don't give us that because they're giving us a gift. They, that's just part and parcel of an indicator, in my opinion, anyhow, where we could go. So if we focused really well on grounding ourselves and keeping ourselves very well grounded, and we focused on manifesting our frequency and changing our frequency, then we would be able to make it even better for the horses in our lives because now they would be getting the benefit of our higher higher frequency. And when we get better at doing that, then that means when they're having a bad day, we're able to send the frequency that they need and so they can instantly calm down. They can instantly feel our energy, our space, our support. Yeah, so I think, you know, they are very good windows or mirrors for learning. And they exist in the moment. And yes, of course, they have memory. But for most of their life, they spend in this moment. They're not thinking about breakfast and they're not thinking about yesterday they're in this moment and if we really want to connect with them we need to be in the same moment we need to share the same moment we can't be wondering if we're holding the halter rope right because then we're no longer in that same moment and so of course if the horse is looking at you and going well are you holding the halter rope right well then maybe that should be in your head but I can tell you that I've never had a horse where they're thinking about whether you're holding the rope right I think we can learn a lot about you know and I say this quite often so when we become what our horse needs our horse becomes what we need that two-way street thing cannot help but happen And that's where all of the magic connection is found and felt at. It starts with us. It it does. And they, I feel like they have so many signs. I mean, they they communicate uh, and they, they use their body and their, their voice even to communicate what they need and what they desire. And, I am finding that there are so many people who don't know how to listen to them. And instead of, you know, instead of seeing their behavior as a behavior from a horse, they see it as a bad behavior and then they shut them down and they break them. And uh, I have learned from all of our horses that it's not about, forcing them it's about communication not control and the minute that i dropped my expectations for our training and our riding and even our relationship i gained her soul and she gained mine and now we are one we are one and it illuminates the fact that we are you know from you know, that oneness, that driving force that drives us all on this planet. I, I love what you said about the horses really just being in the moment and they're not they're not concerned necessarily with like how you're going about a particular thing or what your next step or what you're trying to accomplish. Have you found it for yourself that they helped you illuminate that within you? Working with them has illuminated all of the things within me that I had, the false expectations and stuff about myself. And as I have gone internally to help sort that out, the natural progression has been such that the relationship with the horses have just flourished. I've, other than when I lost this, I've kind of been like this my whole life. What you're describing is... um what I call horses poking holes. Horses will always poke holes and show you when you're not congruent. They'll show you when you're not functioning how they function in the moment. And so they show you these things. So as an example, you're leading your horse 
And so then your horse is walking way too close to you and it makes you uncomfortable. So they're poking a hole in your boundary. They're showing you you're not clear on your boundary because if you were clear on what your space was, they're experts at reading your body language. They're experts at reading your energy. They would never set foot within it. They are very good at showing us where we, we need to work on different areas within ourselves. And at the same time, they're very good at showing us when we're in a space that's really good for them. Because when we are congruent, and when I use that word, I mean what's in my subconscious mind matches my conscious mind, matches my energy, and everything's aligned. All of the horses want to come and be with you. All of the horses want to be in your space. All of the horses are happy to see you. They're not wrinkling up an nostril. They're happy to see you. But it takes a lot of practice to get that congruency because everything in the horse world is about looking a certain way, being a certain way, and having certain tools and all of these things. And so then when you're learning, it just fills you with all doubt. So then you're constantly wondering, well, am I doing this right? Well, what happens if I wreck my horse? Well, what happens if I... And so all of these doubts, people seem to, they, they get caught up in them being self-doubts, and then it becomes a personal issue. In what I teach, we work a lot on that stuff too, because we need to get rid of that. It doesn't exist in the horse world. that They don't know if you're doing it right or wrong. They only know if they like it or not. So let's learn to understand what they're telling us, and let's work so they're happy and you're happy. Yeah. So tell us more about your work in your uh, Partner Up program. It started as a way to give back. So I didn't go on this journey to have all of this, this information die when I die. Like, let me tell you, I didn't walk this walk just to like let this go out the window. So that's what spurned the putting this all together. So I, I started off, when I, in original, I started off teaching it live but people only wanted to, you know, book three days at a time. So I'm trying to cram, you know, 20 years of my brain injury learning stuff in um, three days. Wow, it was pretty tough. Then COVID hit. And so then I saw that as an opportunity to put the stuff online. And so I had to learn how to do everything online. I didn't know how. And I had to learn how to do PowerPoints. I didn't know how to do them. Like everything about this whole partner program has been so much work for me and such a huge learning curve that some days I can't even believe that I have stuck with it because none of this has been easy. But my desire not to let what I've learned die with me is beyond imagine. And then when I can, I can see the people that I've worked with, the difference that it makes in their lives and the difference it makes in their horses' lives, well, then that means quitting would be like, I don't know how I'd live with myself. So that's, you know, in essence. So I start off in uh, the first section, and it's three parts. So the first part is giving yourself, the human, the foundation. So in this whole program, I only work with you, like the human. I don't work with you and your horse because I'm a firm believer when you get, where you need to go, everything that you need to have happen is just going to happen because that congruency is going to be there. So you're going to think it, they'll know it, and they'll give you a try. They might not get it right, but you'll be able to say to them, net, net, I, I want it more like this, and they'll give another try. Or you'll look at yourself and go, oh, what's part in me, what part in this am I holding? So why is my horse not getting this? What's my part? And so the two of you learned how to work together because together you're strong and the two of you can do anything. The part, you're like weak links. So join that chain and you guys can go anywhere. And so that's really in part one what we do. So we, I start off with the subconscious brain, how powerful it is, how it affects us, 
how it keeps us from getting where we need to go. And then we start working on identifying all of the reasons why most times people quit on themselves or don't show up for themselves, um, don't know how to support themselves. And so we work all through that. And then we start working on identifying uh, different traits, different ways of learning, really getting to know who you are and why you are the way you are with no judgment, only acceptance, because this is our base that we're going to start building our strong house on. So we want to shore you up on all four corners so that no matter what you go to take after this, this workshop is like, building you the finest building you can possibly have because you have that foundation for all further learning to go on. So I never design partner up to compete with anything else that's out there. It's meant to be what you do for yourself first before you go anywhere else. It's meant to be that number one block. So you give yourself this and then when you go to a clinician or a trainer, now you're able to understand what they're saying. You're able to absorb everything that they have to give you. And you know yourself well enough to ask the questions that you need to ask to get the information in a way in which it works for you. Because so much of what happens in our world is you're taught to replicate things. Well, as long as you're replicating something, you're not congruent because you're too worried about whether or not your replication is right. And so you're also missing what the horse is saying, because again, you're focused on yourself and what you're doing instead of listening to what your horse has to say. Then we start talking about energy, what it is, how to know that it's there, and to know how powerful it is. If we want to have the strongest energy possible, we really need to ensure Everything that we say to ourselves is full of gratitude, full of love, full of support, because it's very, very powerful. It's so powerful. And these things that we're talking about in these energetic bodies, all of it really, been around for eons, dating back to like thousands and thousands of years of indigenous people and teachings and People have been killed and burned at the stake for yeah. in, in generations past. Uh, it just sounds like you are alluding to the idea that we have so much conditioning as humans, and that conditioning causes blockages not only within our, our mind construct, but also the flow of the energy that we have throughout our bodies. Our bodies and our spirits. Yeah, and then we try to go and work with a horse or any other species for that matter and we bring all of that baggage and those blockages with us absolutely so then we're still in you know the foundation part so then we start working on now um understanding what your horse is saying and how they communicate by the time you're finished you know exactly what every single expression on that horse's face means and you know how to read it and you also will know how to feel it. And so uh, I work on that a lot because we have to get to a place of feeling because then we're out of our heads. And the more we can stay out of our heads, the better we are in this whole connection thing because they're not functioning really in their heads. They're functioning as a feeling whole body. And so we need to get there. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Definitely. So then the oh. second part is all on fear. It's a fairly big section as well, because whether we realize it or not, we have fear every single day of our lives. It's just in varying degrees. So you wonder if you look okay, you know, if your clothes are the right clothes. Like it's just nondescript. You go out on a date and you wonder what the date thought of you, right? Like, I mean, it's just never ending. Every single thought that we have has a physiological effect in our body. All of that creates problems. And eventually, with some people, and it happened to me, I ended up getting, I couldn't just get anxiety 
trust anxiety. No, I had to get PTSD. So my whole journey has been about let's go right to the max, give her the worst. <laughs> let's see how she's going to deal with this. Anyhow, through the course of all of that, I began to recognize exactly everything that goes awry in our bodies is the same thing that goes awry in the horse's bodies. So then uh, I figured out, because, you know, they treat anxiety or PTSD or depression as a mind thing, and it's not any of those things. That's just the last place it shows up. So I spent a lot of time learning how to do certain things to change the physiological response and bring my body back to a state of balance and peace and rest. So uh, that's all in that section, and I share it. And then I also share all of the different frequency meditation stuff that I found to be really, really beneficial for changing your mindset. Because if you can't change your mindset, no amount of work on your physical body is going to make one ounce of difference because it's, it is, it's, it's a mind shift perception thing. And then, so then we're all finished that. And then we move into the anatomics. Then in the fear part, there's a whole section on your horse care. And I call it think outside of the box horse care, because you have a horse and you want to do the best thing that you can for that horse. So that means you're flipping through magazines, you're listening to what experts have to say, you're doing all this stuff, and you're replicating what you're getting from there. But at no point in time are you taking a step back and going, okay, how did my horse evolve to exist? <laughs> so what part do I have in their discomfort, even though I'm trying to provide them with the most comfort? So typically, we have them in paddocks. They don't have a say about what paddock they're in. They don't have a say when their food's arriving. They don't have a say who comes into the paddock. They don't have a say about really dick shit because we've made all those choices and decisions for them all under the belief that we're doing the best thing for them. But if we were to take a step back, then we'd have to go, well, huh, takes over 100 years for evolution to change one thing you know, the pace at which we've, they're so far behind, same as us. Like, you know, we have not even begun to adapt to the changes in our environment. There's a big uh, section there too, because I think it's really important and, and not to make somebody feel inadequate, but to really start looking around at your setup and thinking, how can I change this? Oh, well, I can do this. And then you look for your horses. Well, do they like this? Oh, I'm on the right track. Or no, that's still not. And I, I, my hopes are that it opens you up to the possibilities and opens you up to the fun that can happen with that exploration in trying to get the yes answers and going, yeah, I'm on the right track. Okay, so how about if we do this? And there's just so much more to it and being in their environment. And we're on that journey as well. I mean, not too long ago, we opened up and now they're in about an acre uh, paddock that they're able to, and we're, we're expanding that. We're on 10 acres. And so probably, you know, a good portion of that eventually is going to be devoted to horses and maybe be able to expand that with adjacent properties and stuff over the years but that's um, the hope yeah got a question for yeah. you what's your favorite way of reinforcing your horse or your horses my energy i'm not a treat person and i'm not a clicker trainer because as you know if i'm thinking about pressing the clicker well i'm not there i'm not present so um i i don't get to use all of the traditional ways because it doesn't work with my brain injury so I use my energy and so when they do something I make sure that inside I feel like I just lit up and they feel that that's what I've been doing a lot of lately and this all flows personally from my yoga and meditation practice from throughout the years and yeah we work on that stuff as well yeah. it's very exciting yeah. it's beautiful yeah. I don't find it woo woo anymore. I really don't. No. Yeah, it's just real. Yeah, that's 
that's how I would put it. I would put it, I, I think, I, well, I don't even think. I honestly believe that we were born with everything that we needed. Somehow it just got shit canned out of us or we got too busy to cultivate it. Yeah, if that's, you think, I, I hear that. And then there's our society that seems so like messed up in so many ways. But If you think about when you're little, up until you're probably three years old, you rely 100% on energy to determine whether or not you're safe or not. And then suddenly by the time you hit school, well, you're suddenly not even operating in that same same space. And yeah, you know, There's a lot of conditioning and shutdown. Yeah, yeah. It seems, at least in the horse world, we're, we're shifting in that way. And I'll seem to, and maybe it's just we're knee-deep in it, but a lot of people seem to be... The, the light bulbs illuminating, maybe even societal, yes. society wide, in a lot of ways, because something's got to give. Mona, we really appreciate the time that you've been able to and been willing to share with us. And wow, what a powerful conversation yeah. on many different levels. Uh, is there any last bits that you wanted to share? No, you know, um, you can go online, you know. And, uh, read about you know my partner up if you want or you can message me if you want yeah and we'll that. we'll post uh links out to your website and your work that'll all be in the show notes 